So good morning, uh, lecture family, HRM sir, Rasajanti sir, Muli sir, Sudhir sir, all senior consultants, colleagues, friends. Today we will be having this month's breakfast CME by the by, by multidisciplinary uh, topic Rapid Six by the Rapid Six team, advances in stroke management. So we will be having four speakers. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Kevin is out of station due to an emergency, so that topic will be covered by Murli sir. The other speakers are Dr. Dairo, Dr. Bindu and Dr. Sayyad sir. The chairpersons will be Murli sir and Dr. Sudhi sir. So we request the uh, chairpersons and speakers to please come on stage and start the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, wish you all a pleasant morning. Um, we have this uh, topic which is very close to the heart of all of our neurologists and as well as the neurosurgeons and of course that. Um, so let us kick off the proceedings with uh, Dr. Murli. Actually, uh, stroke is full of uncertainties and like so even the stroke uh, uh, CME came to an uncertain uh, finale because uh, Dr. Kevin was supposed to <coughs> Uh, manage this talk, but unfortunately he had to leave for a trivandrum for a uh, emergency uh, court duty. Uh, so he gave me the slides and asked me to present. No, I also offered him to present this particular case. Uh, I am uh, just talking about the emergency management of stroke in the emergency department. Uh, so stroke or what we call as a cerebrovascular disease is defined as a sudden occurrence of a focal non-convulsive neurological deficits due to a sudden interruption of blood flow to the brain resulting in a damage to the brain. So it will not usually cover the usual uh, epilepsy or uh, a seizure which we uh, come across in a, a metabolic encephalopathy uh, and so and so. <clears throat> now stroke is considered to be one of the third common cause of death after cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer. But uh, it is still probably the most important cause of morbidity in such uh, individuals. Uh, so decreasing the morbidity is one of the most common uh, or the end point of a stroke treatment. Around 15 million people are affected worldwide every year. So you can imagine the prevalence of stroke in India when it is around 1.45 or 1.5 per thousand in uh, today's population of India. So the morbidity and the death rate is also going to be increased. Now coming to the risk factors of strokes, you have the modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. The non-modifiable risk factors are the age, gender, uh, the genetic aspects, hereditary, uh, race, uh, history of a prior stroke is unmodifiable. <coughs> then behavioral patterns like an unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, obesity, morbid, tobacco and alcohol overuse. Uh, previous history of stroke, these are the conditions which you can potentially modify to decrease the uh, stroke in a later date. So previous stroke, hypertension, control of hypertension, control of uh, uh, dyslipidemias, cardiac disease particularly in our setup, uh, atrial fibrillation, diabetes and uh, sickle cell disease which is not very common in our condition. And there are many types of stroke. This is the okay. This is the uh, ischemic type of stroke where you have an abrupt blood supply cut off. Uh, you have the uh, hypotense area and the CT, and this is the hemorrhage that probably must, must have taken after uh, thrombolysis or uh, in mechanical thrombolysis. So it's, uh, ischemic strokes are more common than hemorrhagic strokes. It uh, accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of the cases. And it can be because of uh, two aspects. One, it could be because of an in situ uh, thrombus in the uh, major arteries, either the uh, internal carotid or the MCA or the ACA. Uh, or it could be because of an embolic phenomenon that can occur either from the heart or from the major vessels like the carotid. You can have an artery to artery embolism. Uh, this is a hemorrhagic stroke. I think we'll be dealing with the neurosurgeons more. You have either a small hemorrhage or you can have a hemorrhage into an infarct. It is known as a hemorrhagic transformation, which we do basically because of our intervention or it can occur, occur spontaneously also. Then you have the 
uh, midline shift and all those things. It can also be uh, hemorrhagic, hemorrhage into the brain can be parenchymal or subarachnoid, um, which is usually caused by aneurysms. <coughs> now, how do you recognize a stroke in the ED or in the periphery? This is by the acronym of FAST, where you have initially a facial droop, uh, that it is uh, by in medical terms it is a human facial palsy. Then you put the arms together upward and you see a pronator drift or the drift of the arm. Then you have a speech abnormality, either a dysarthria or difficulty to find the appropriate words, as we call as aphasia. And then it is time to call the hospital, the stroke unit for treatment. And now uh, you can also additionally have loss of vision and uh, imbalance. Imbalance per se may not be the major cause of stroke or uh, it can be whether it is an, uh, according to the localization but a pure vertigo by itself seldom leads to a stroke. Now these are the arm drift you can see the patient will close the eye and extend the arm straight out with the palm up and if you have a drift of the palm of the weak arm in the patient cannot hold it for more than about 10 seconds or less than 10 seconds then you could call it a pronated drift. You can see that there is a mild weakness or a human weakness of the affected arm. You can always go for the, uh, the grip uh, that you do it in a more uh, sophisticated environment like the hospital. This you can do it in the periphery also. Then the facial droop, we have a normal uh, facial that is the uh, angle of the mouth is going both uh, normally and you have the abnormal one, one part of the uh, face does not move and most of the uh, lay people will say that the affected side will be the side of the uh, deviation of the mouth where we know that it is not so, it is the affected side will not move. Then the abnormal speech as I already said you can have dysarthria because of sl or the slurring of speech or you can have an aphasia where you have difficulty to find the appropriate words, circumlocution, abnormal in naming all those. So other symptoms like confusion, when you have a confusion then uh, uh, you have to think of a bilateral hemispherical infarction or sometimes medial temporal lobe, medial occipital lobe. So localization is also important as far as a neurologist is concerned uh, regarding the site of uh, the stroke. Headache with altered sensorium usually uh, will say that this is more like a hemorrhagic stroke rather than an ischemic stroke. Numbness of one side of the body, usually you can have it in a thalamic stroke, very common, you have a, a hemiparesthesia or a hemianesthesia. A paralysis of one side of the body, as usual, hemi, uh, hemiplegia or a hemiparesis. Visual disturbance can be either unilateral. If you have a unilateral blindness, then you have to think of a carotid stroke or a carotid uh, amaroxis fugax. You have to always look for carotids. And then you can have bilateral either hemianopia or cotton anopia where you are dealing with a uh, lesion of the occipital lobe. Now, in an occipital lobe, in fact, you may not have uh, a weakness as such. So sometimes these are the people who come to us late, after the time of thrombolysis, after the time of intervention. Uh, trouble with walking, of course, when you have a weakness, you will have uh, uh, swaying while walking. Bladder or bowel incontinence usually does not occur with stroke per se, but if it is stroke associated with a seizure, you can have a bladder or a bowel incontinence. In the ED, what are the guidelines that we follow here? Within 10 minutes, the initial assessment is done. They do the examination, they secure <coughs> IV lines because once the patient is shifted to thrombolysis, putting an IV will be difficult because the patient can profusely bleed. So always look for hypoglycemia because even I have seen patients who come with hypoglycemia with focal deficits. If there is a hypoglycemia, we have to treat the hypoglycemia and always remember to give time in before the sugar is concerned because otherwise we will be precipitating a vernicase encephalopathy. Then by the side by side, we always go in for a CT scan. Within 25 minutes, the scan is complete. We in our hospital, we do the CT scan plane with a CT angio of the major vessels of the neck vessels and as well as the uh, cranial, uh, cerebral vessels. And interpretation of CT is done in the CT uh, console itself. Sometimes the patient may be shifted for a diffusion weighted MRI 
to see so if the CT is normal to see if there is a brainstem stroke, sometimes you may not be able to localize it if the patient is comatose or the patient is confused. Then if there is the C, if the CT is normal and even if sometimes if the CT shows uh, 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 stenosis without any CT changes like an infarct, we go into an IV thrombolysis. The IV thrombolysis can be given in about uh, uh, three to four and a half hours up to. Now, this is the NIHS score, the National Institute of Health Stroke uh, scale, where you have a lot of questions to be asked. You uh, assess the level of consciousness, the visuals, the facials, the motor of the arm, the motor of the leg, the limb ataxia, sensory, language, speech per se, and inattentions. The score is around 42, the total score. I'm not going elaborately into the NIHS stroke. And if there is the stroke zero, the scale is zero, the score is zero, then you are not dealing with a stroke. Then uh, zero to four or there zero to five is a minor stroke. And then according to the uh, images that we get, we may either go in for either a thrombolysis or uh, sometimes just antiplatelets. Moderate stroke, five to 15, we have to be a little more careful because thrombolysis sometimes may produce a bleed that we tend to do. 16 to 20 is around a moderate to severe stroke and more than 20 is always a severe stroke. So in severe strokes, even if there is a large vessel disease, we do thrombolyze, but then we keep Dr. Dharav always present there because uh, you may have to go in for a mechanical thrombectomy and after which Dr. Subhish may take over. So the eligibility criteria is, is very simple, more than 18 years. Uh, age as such is not a criteria for thrombolysis. So any patient even after 80, sometimes we can thrombolyze according to the NIH score. It should be an acute stroke within four to four and a half hours. Um, then there are a lot of contraindications. The contraindications is uh, a hemorrhage on the CT and MRI definitely is a contraindication. A CT evidence of an obvious hypertensive. If the CT shows an infarct, which is recent, not the old one, then probably you, you are not going to get much benefit by doing a thrombolysis. Then uh, a history of a, a stroke three months prior is probably a relative <coughs> contraindication, but not an uh, absolute contraindication. Then any surgeries, probably uh, a surgery, particularly in a, a, a head trauma, an injury or abdominal surgery, if you go in for a thrombolysis, then probably you have had it. <coughs> Gastrointestinal bleeding, bleeding peptic ulcers, uh, probably even bleeding piles may sometimes warrant you to differ from uh, uh, thrombolysis. Platelets less than uh, uh, 1 lakh, then treatment of warfare in where the INR is more than 1.7. So if the patient is on an anticoagulant, do a warfare, do a PTINR, if it is less than probably 1.5, then you can take in for thrombolysis because uh, uh, the warfare may have been started for a uh, atrial fibrillation. And so if there is a reduced uh, uh, PTINR, the warfare is not active. So probably you would be benefited by doing a thrombolysis. Then uh, clinical suspicion of inf infective endocarditis because these are more likely, likely to be uh, embolic stroke and the embolic strokes are usually very large. So the chance of uh, bleed during an infective endocarditis is very, very high. Okay, uh, aneurysms uh, which are not treated, giant aneurysms or unsecured aneurysms are only a little risky in taking up for thrombolysis. Neoplasms inside the, the brain, probably you are going to create a bleed and uh, a cerebral microbleed which we usually see in an MRI if there are more than 10, it probably may have to defer your thrombolysis. Now, uh, every one of I had heard about the RAPID-6 call going on. The RAPID-6 consists of, it's a uh, multidisciplinary approach where the emergency department, the neuro neurologist or the neuromedicine, neurosurgeon, intervention radiologist, critical care and the radiology team. So there are six departments that is taking place, taking into the care of this patient. That's why we named it the RAPID-6. It should be rapid later. It was started in a hospital by around 2021. Actually, it was meant to be started before the pandemic, but somehow the pandemic came and we couldn't, uh, we had to take care of the COVID patients. As soon as the patient arrives in the emergency department, the doctors, 
The initial assessment suggests that is a possibility of stroke. The rapid six code is announced in the public address system, and then simultaneously, all from these departments arrive at the uh, emergency department. The simultaneously, the patient history is uh, collected and assessment of the patient is done. Examination, the NIH stroke stroke uh, scale is then a uh, score is then uh, uh, instituted. Cannula is always uh, given uh, because you have to have a, I, as I already said that the cannula should be in situ and then the GRB is to look for any hypoglycemia, blood is taken for other investigations, whatever that is needed and we always do a rice tube if the patient is having aspiration and of course we do a, a urinary catheterization because after thrombolysis we do a catheter and it bleeds then you had it, then probably Datsun also will come into play. Simultaneously, uh, in less than five minutes of the announcement of the code, all these people from the different departments arrive. arrive. Uh, the radiology, which I have to thank them for, will uh, take time and clear the CT table for an emergency CT. The CT hardly takes around five minutes, but uh, it's the logistics that carrying the patient from the uh, casualty to the uh, uh, CT table, taking the, uh, into the CT, this thing, securing him, uh, securing the IAB and sometimes if you have to do a contrast we may have sometimes we don't usually wait for the urea creatine levels we also in an emergency situation it's done and then we achieve this around, around 10 minutes uh, from the assessment or from the patient arriving to the ER to the CT table is around 10 minutes that is uh, uh, by the international standards and then we do the uh, see a plain CT, CT angio is done once we know that the CT does not show an infarct. Also, the, the, the patient shows an infarct, then the thrombolysis, then you have time. Then we have to do an angio look for any major vessel disease. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now uh, when the CT is, uh, CT is completed, if within the window period, that is three hours or up to four and a half hours, even during thrombolysis, what you have to learn is that the if you uh, uh, delay the thrombolysis, you are going to get more complications. So earlier, the better. Then prior to thrombolysis, the exclusion, exclusion criteria is checked and it's excluded. The PP is always maintained below 180 to rule out a uh, reperfusion injury. And then consent and financial counseling is very important because these are going to be very, uh, what do you call, uh, economic uh, burden to the patient. If within 24 hours there is a major vessel occlusion, vessel occlusion, then we plan for a thrombectomy. A thrombectomy is done in the cath lab. Uh, up to six hours in a ma major carotid stroke, we can go in for going for a thrombectomy, and up to 48 hours in a vertebral basal stroke, we can go in for a thrombectomy. And then even after, for a thrombectomy, we need uh, a financial counselling for the patient. Many of our patients leave us after the thrombolysis. Our numbers in the last one year after initiation, we have been able to detect uh, early stroke, both ischemic as well as hemorrhagic. The time to intervention was compared to the international guidelines, which is quite normal. And uh, we have been able to improve our earlier timings. From January uh, to December 22nd, there was around 170 rapid six calls. That is probably one in two days. And then uh, stroke was identified in about uh, 131 patients. Sometimes as we say that some of these imbalances may also be coming under the rapid six calls. This means the stroke was around 60 to 61 percentage, hemorrhagic around uh, 15 percentage. A TAA was around 23 percentage. Uh, these patients come with a history of uh, weakness. Uh, once we do the CT or even while coming to the ER, the weaknesses just vanish. So these could be TAAs which we don't have to thrombolyze, but we will have to observe them. Then the th uh, total case of thrombolysis is around 21 percentage. This uh, uh, will uh, around 22 patients we have thrombolyzed with IV thrombolysis. Thrombectomy was done in three, but uh, it is not because of the lack of expertise that is in the hospital. Probably because of more of con financial constraints that the, sometimes the patient is taken away after thrombolysis, even sometimes before thrombolysis. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, even my colleagues in neurology department, neurosurgery department, Dr. Thara, uh, Dr. Thara, Dr. Uh, Julio, who clears the table for an emergency diffusion weighted images, and the uh, neuro with the critical care team. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Marvi. Uh, that was spot on time. So let's try and uh, finish the talks and have the discussion at the end uh, as we are running a little late. So let's stick to time. I think uh, next is uh, Dr. Bindu who will be talking on the medical management of uh, stroke including thrombolysis. Persons, senior colleagues and my dear friends, I welcome every one of you towards today's scientific session. My topic for today's discussion is medical management of acute stroke. As this topic for today's discussion was uh, offered to us, actually no second thought crossed our mind because no other field in neurology has undergone such dramatic, such drastic changes as in case of vascular or stroke neurology. Stroke, as we all know, is an acute onset of a focal neurological deficit due to a vascular cause. And this entity was described as early as 400 BC by Hippocrates who described it as apoplexy, which is a Greek terminology which means struck down by violence. Even now we follow the term stroke implying the same meaning. Now their concept for management of stroke was written down as it is impossible to cure a severe attack of apoplexy and it is difficult to cure a mild one. And this concept was followed maybe even up to 25, till up till 25 years ago. But the nihilism of the former times have now gone and the enthusiasm of new treatment strategies have now come in. So there has been paradigm shifts everywhere the clinical standpoint from an expectant view to an active treatment view, the radiological viewpoint and the therapeutic viewpoint, everything has changed. Now let us see one patient who is a 65 year old gentleman who has history of recurrent migraine. Now history of diabetes mellitus who is on insulin and OHAs for its management. History of hypertension on beta blockers. He is a heavy smoker and a heavy consumer of alcohol. Now while brushing his teeth, he developed clonic movements involving the right upper limb and face lasting for around two minutes. This was followed by an acute onset of facial deviation with right-sided weakness. The patient was not speaking or obeying commands post this episode. He was seen by his wife at 7 a.m and he was bring, brought to the emergency care. Thanks to the acronym BFAST, she has noticed that the patient has developed facial palsy, he has developed arm drift, he has developed <coughs> speech disturbance. Now the time is coming into play, time is of the essence while treating stroke. So now the patient is brought as early as possible to the emergency department. In the emergency department, as sir has rightly elaborated, the patient is evaluated for the ABCs, the airway, the breathing, the circulation, everything is looked for. Now the syndrome is identified. In this case, we have the syndrome that is the right focal seizures uh, and right hemiplegia with aphasia. So the differential diagnosis which are considered here will include the first one, CVA left MCA tertiary infarct. The second one, could it be a hemiplegic migraine where a patient has a focal neurological deficit and the patient already has a chronic migrainous history? So could it be that the next could be a Todd's palsy where the patient after having a seizure could develop a focal neurological deficit or weakness of a sight? So could it be that and the last possibility of course is a hypoglycemia when the patient is on insulin and is developing a focal neurological deficit always look for a hypoglycemia and correct it as early as possible. Now as soon as the possibility of a CVA is brought in the rapid 6 will be ringing through our corridors and on command of the ER physician the ER sister will initiate the code stroke. Now once this comes into play, the entire core team members that includes all the six departments, everybody will be alerted and the stroke team will come and they will assess the severity of the stroke. So the severity is assessed by the NIH score, the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. Here we assess the, the, the neurological system one by one and points are allotted for each of these. For example, 
you assess the level of consciousness, you assess whether the patient is alert, whether he is drowsy, whether he is stuporous or comatose. So you can see that a point is given for each. If the patient is alert, you give a value of zero. If the patient is drowsy, you give a point of uh, one. And if he is stuporous, you give a point of two and three if the patient is comatose. So this is just one example as one single point that is uh, checked. And likewise, every point is looked and the score is written down on the right hand side and everything is now computed together to give what is called the NIHS score. So that once you come to the NIHS score, now you know the severity of the score. This is a scoring system where you have scores from 0 to 42. And now you have this system. See, 0 means no stroke sy symptoms. Probably we are not dealing with a stroke at all. 1 to 4 means a minor stroke, 5 to 15 means a moderate stroke, 16 to 20 is a moderate to severe stroke and 21 to 42 is a severe stroke. So now you know the time of onset, you know the syndrome, now you have come to the NIHS score where you know the severity of the stroke. Now we have to proceed to the imaging modalities because now we are thinking about the treatment to be extended. So the patient is now directly wheeled in into the CT room where the CT brain is taken. The next, uh, next investigation routinely done here is the CT along with the CT angiogram. The MRI brain, the perfusion studies and the DAC. These are undertaken only in selective cases. So once the CT is done, now why CT? CT is the workhorse for stroke management. You know why? Because it's available everywhere, it's available 24-7. You have, uh, you have the expertise available everywhere and it can be done in a very short span of time. Say two to three minutes is what is enough for a CT. <laughs> and you don't need a sedation or anything for the patient. And you can easily identify the contraindications of stroke. You take the CT, you see the bleed and then one treatment modality is just rolled out. And also you can identify the early CT signs for strokes. So all these things and also relatively inexpensive. So almost all the patients can afford this modality. So this becomes the most chosen modality, the essential modality before a thrombolysis is taken up. Now what are the goals when you go in for a CT brain? You exclude an intracranial hemorrhage which would preclude a thrombolysis. You are looking for early features of ischemia. See here, you can see that there is a hyperdense area in the cerebellar area. Again, thrombolysis straight away out. Now, you look for early ischemic signs in uh, CT. Uh, you look for an uh, insular uh, ribbon sign where the, there is a loss of gray white differentiation in the insular area. You look for the cortical ribboning where you have the loss of gray white differentiation in the other cortical areas obscuration of the basal ganglia. So these are the early CT signs that you look for. Also you can look for stroke mimics like for example you have a patient with a brain tumor who is presenting with a seizure followed by a right hemiparesis. So you have, you can, uh, I mean you can try to identify, not rule out of course, but you can look for some stroke mimics also. Then you go, go forward for a also, another very important sign is the dense MCA sign. Dense MCA sign where you can see the hyperdense area in the MCA area. So here you have the left MCA showing the dense MCA sign which could implicate a clot in the MCA. There is also a scoring scale for radiology. It's called an aspect score where images are taken in the supraganglionic and the ganglionic levels. Again, points are allotted for each of the early ischemic signs and points are deducted for each of these and finally you come to what is known as aspect score. So you have NIHS score which is a clinical severity scale, then you have the aspect score which is a radiological severity scale. Now, now we proceed to a CT angiogram and CT angiogram where you push in a contrast and then you look for any obstruction of the major vessels. If there is a major vessel occlusion, now we have to bring in Dr. Thara also into the picture. Now what is the role of MRI in this situation? See, if, the, if there is a stroke mimic that is thought about, you have to go in for a MRI. Example, tumor, abscess, etc. 
If the stroke onset is not clear, most of the time, uh, many times actually we encounter patients who really do not know when the stroke uh, began. Patient wakes up with a neurological deficit, then how are we going to assess the time of onset? So in such cases, we can resort to MRI to find, to establish an area which is salvageable by reperfusion therapy, by which again you can go ahead with a treatment modality. Now, now we know the syndrome, the severity, and now whether there is any major vessel involvement or not. If there is a major vessel infarct you, uh, involvement, you go ahead with a thrombolysis followed by a thrombectomy procedure which Dr. Tara will be speaking about. If there is no large vessel involvement, then we have to go for an IV thrombolysis. Now, what are the indications for an IV thrombolysis? A patient who is older than 18 years with a disabling stroke with an onset time of less than 4.5 hours, you can go ahead for a thrombolysis. Also, the contraindications we have to look for recently they have added one more indication a wake up stroke with diffusion flare mismatch i already told you that you have to resort to an mri in case of strokes where you do not know where the exact onset time is so there are plenty of contraindications a whole lot of them i am not going to read out each one of, of them to you so there are many contraindications many of them implicates a bleeding, a chance of bleeding. So those cases we have to uh, we have to chart out and if there is uh, any contraindication then the thrombolytic procedure is abandoned. So there are two agents currently available for IV thrombolysis. One is an RTPA recombinant tissue plasminogen activator and another one Chenecteplase which is a bioengineered variant of the same RTPA that we used to have initially. So RTP is given in a dose of 0.9 mg per kg body weight, 10% of which is given as an IV bolus dose. This is followed by an IV infusion of the rest of the dose which is given over a period of 1 hour. Tenecter place now after that came in, now I think uh, this is being used more commonly. This is faster to be given, it can be given as a bolus dose in a dose of 0.25 mg per kg body weight. Straight away you get time is saved so that especially so when you have a large vessel involvement and you want to uh, shift the patient for a thrombectomy procedure, this becomes very useful. Now post revascularization care once this drug is delivered now we have to concentrate on the pp management the diabetes management and also the general management hypertension management is very important every 15 minutes for the initial two hours we have to keep monitoring the bp and every 30 minutes for the next six hours we have to monitor the bp Later, every hour we have to monitor. So if there is a BP elevation more than 180 by 105, we have to uh, essentially bring the BP to a lower level because the chance for symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage is more when the BP is on the <coughs> higher side. So what are the drugs that are usually used? The drugs used are the Lebetalol, Nicardipine, Inalaprilat. So those are the drugs that are given. So these are given and the BP is managed less than uh, 180 by 105 for the initial 24 hours. So uh, how do we check whether we are uh, working adequately? See, there are certain times that have been uh, described, door to physician time, door to stroke team, door to CT initiation, door to CT interpretation, door to drug. I think this is the most important one, the door to drug time. Most often we are able to give the uh, IV thrombolysis within this uh, stipulated period, that is within 60 minutes. And now over to... Dr. Thara for uh, his uh, talk on large vessel strokes. Thank you. The, the door is the hospital door. Hospital door. <coughs> Dharab, over to you. Good morning everybody. So uh, I'll start my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, stroke intervention. So this is the rapid six protocol what we follow, already talked uh, about. So basically any patient like uh, symptom onset uh, less than 4.5 hours nhs score is high and then we give away thrombolysis 
If it is uh, more than 4.5 hour, IV thrombolysis is out. If major vessel occlusion is there, we give IV thrombolysis and then take patient for the thrombectomy. We do angiography if with IV thrombolysis vessel is open, we don't do thrombectomy, just angiography. If vessel is not open, we take patient for the thrombectomy. More than 4.5 hours, major vessel occlusion, we take for the thrombectomy. So this is the protocol we follow. This is our rapid 6 protocol, flow chart. I will discuss uh, uh, rapid 6, uh, this is a team uh, involved and this is already covered by Dr. Bindus, I will skip it. So uh, I am going to talk first about ischemic stroke. So not all strokes require intervention, so there are many variety of stroke uh, like a small vessel disease uh, just require medical management <laughs> and then second variety is a thromboembolism. Uh, only major vessel occlusion like this case where you have a large thrombus occluding the cerebral artery, internal carotid artery, basilar artery you require intervention. So as compared to the, the myocardial infarction, uh, no, MI. The stroke is little different. Most of the time we have clot coming from somewhere and then uh, going to the brain. So what are the sources of clot coming? It can come from the heart due to various factors, atrial fibrillation, any dysfunction, valvular heart disease. It can come from the artery to artery. It can come from the common carotid artery and um, going to the brain. So if the clot is very large uh, coming from any source, it can block the major vessel. You can see in this animation. If it is very small, or multiple fragments you can go distally and occlude the smaller vessel producing a minor stroke. So intervention is required in large vessel occlusion because these strokes are very severe, it can be deadly, it can cause malignant MC infarction. So we need to do intervention. So what is the basic pathophysiology of the, any stroke intervention? You can compare it with the slow solar eclipse. We have umbra and the penumbra. So we need to save the penumbra. We'll see in this animation, suppose there is a clot in the middle cerebral artery. So this is the middle cerebral artery, this is the right hemisphere. So MCA will supply this area of the brain. And because of blockage, immediately adjacent area will be damaged. Neuron can't survive without blood for five minutes. So some brain damage will happen. But we have collaterals from the 90 cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, which will which will have some supply to the adjacent area. So this is a salvageable brain. So this is infarction, this is ischemia, umbra and penumbra. So our aim is to restore the blood supply as soon as possible and save the penumbra. So we can do with the IV thrombolysis, you can do with the mechanical thrombectomy. But as time passes, the score will increase in size. So we have to do as early as possible. So this is, this is a basic fundamental about any acute stroke care. You have to restore the blood flow. So before uh, taking patient for thrombectomy or anything, uh, we need to assess uh, what is the infarction. Is already if brain is infarcted, then there is no point opening that blood vessel. So we need to do CT angiography, and we can nicely assess so this patient is having left MCA occlusion. But you can see already very large area of hypodensity is there, so it's already infarcted. So we don't take such patient for the thrombectomy. Only if no, 50% or 60% no, area we can solve it, then we take patient for thrombectomy. So this is calculated by the aspect score. And there are many factors involved, no, age of the patient, financial thing, economic factors, what is the area, eloquent, non-eloquent, right and left is different. Some cases we can do MRI also uh, where we are not sure about uh, infarction on the CT. So technique, uh, this is the technique animation, thrombectomy. We go via femoral artery, artery root. We take a guiding catheter here, and so this is the clot in the middle cerebral artery. We cross it with the micro wire, and over this wire, we take a micro catheter across the clot. We go distal to the clot into the normal vessel, and inside this micro catheter, we take a stand. This is a different kind of stand, it is attached to the wire, it's non detachable stand, self expanding stand. So we withdraw the micro catheter and then the stent will expand. We keep it for 7 minutes so that the clot is engaged in the stent. And after 7 minutes, we inflate this balloon tip guiding catheter to prevent uh, forward flow. And then we just take out this stent so that clot will come out. So this is a technique I am using, we can the thrombectomy. This is the picture, you can see the clot is captured in the stent. 
This is attached to the vines, non detachable strand. So we always require anesthesia support. They are ready to give anesthesia at any time. So I am thanking the anesthesia department because most of these patients are not cooperative. Uh, what is the evidence? Uh, many randomized control trial uh, was done in 2015 and they, they, they have shown benefit of mechanical thromectomy over medical management. It is included in the guidelines and uh, some trials they have suggested up to 24 hours you can do it. So if there is no large infarction you can go up to 24 hours also. Let's see this case of 42 year gentleman, uh, known case of rheumatic heart disease, not on anticoagulation. He presented with left sided uh, paralysis and uh, CT angio showed uh, right MC occlusion, uh, hyperdense MCSI, no big infarction on plain CT. IVTP was given as per protocol, 3 hours onset and then uh, patient was taken for thromectomy. So first we do angiography, see this angiography was done and you can see still the artery is not open because IV thrombolysis may not work in major vessel occlusion as the clot burden is large. So thromectomy was done, so this is a micro catheter which was crossed across the clot into the distal vessel and then the stand is deployed here like this, this is clot, here. clot is here. And then after keeping 7 minutes, uh, we have taken out the stand and you can see the clot is come out in the stand. So this is a angiography after thromectomy, you can see your vessel is completely open now. CT done next day, you can see major ganglia infarction but the entire cortex is preserved and this patient recovered very nicely. Another case, 19 year boy uh, presented to hospital, uh, 9 hours onset in a comatose state, GCS was 50, 5 by 15, uh, pupils were uh, not taken to light but not dilated fix. MRI was done uh, since we are suspecting posterior circulation stroke and showed mid basilar artery occlusion and infarction in the bone. So basilar artery is occluded here. Infarction was there in the pons, but it was a young patient, uh, so we taken this patient for thromectomy. This is the left vertebral injection, you can see basilar artery is occluded here. Thromectomy was done, you see the microcatheter strand across the basilar artery into the posterior cerebral artery and then the strand is difficult to see but strand is here. Like this. And then after one pass, uh, artery was completely open, basilar artery is open, this was the uh, clot came out in the stand. This patient had a hypercoagulation state later on find out. So this patient also he was like a normal. It was like very effective treatment for this patient. If without treatment this patient would have died. So this is all about mechanical thromectomy and uh, you know mechanical thromectomy the, the brain is it's different from the heart. The coronary intervention when you do for acute MIS brain is little different because brain can bleed like the heart, the perfusion hemorrhage can happen, so we have to look for that thing also. Vessels are little tortuous, you have to go all the way to the head, they are difficult to reach distally. Vessels are fragile, internal elastic lamina are very thin, so vessel can rupture also and can cause bleed in the brain and that can be life threatening. Clot burden is usually high as compared to the coronary, so you just can't do just no angioplasty and massage the clot or something like that. Because distal embolism uh, can be not forgiving, like it may go into the motor cortex, something like that, so patient will have permanent deficit. So brain is entirely different than the heart, you need a specialist for this thing. Mechanical thromectomy is the most powerful treatment, uh, good recovery chances with medical management are 70%. <coughs> when you do mechanical thromectomy in carefully chosen patient, up to 65% patient will do well. So how do you assess? You assess patient at 3 months and you see whether the patient is independent or not. He can do all independent activities or not. That is the parameter we follow, modified ranking scale. <laughs> now coming to stroke prevention, uh, carotid artery disease is one of the common cause of the stroke. Uh, so when you see carotid bifurcation, high grade stenosis, we should offer a stenting there, multiple randomized control trial. Uh, medical management versus stenting. Uh, let's see this case. A 67 year old lady with left hemiparesis, CT angio showed a carotid origin stenosis. This is an internal carotid artery. You can see high grade stenosis. If you just put this patient on medical management over a period of 6 months, 1 year, this artery is going to close and she will have another stroke. So, all such kind of patients should be offered carotid stenting. Carotid and atectomy is alternate to the carotid stenting. So this patient uh, was offered stenting and uh, carotid stenting is slightly different. Uh, we use a filter device here, you can see it's, it's like a, a temporary filter, we, we place it like this. 
so that during plasty if any clots are coming it, it should not go into the brain and then at the end of uh, angioplasty sending we take out this filter so this is slightly different technique uh, for carotid this is the okay, post stenting so this is a strand was space and she's doing well intracranial atherosclerosis vessels are very small 3 mm 2.5 mm so first episode we try to medically manage antiplatelet statins uh, control of risk factor if patient develops recurrent stroke on medical management uh, or if it is like hemodynamic stroke we offer intervention 52 year old lady uh, presented with right sided weakness learning of speech one day and she was kind of okay but during hospital stay, she was developing recurrent TIAs uh, lasting for 30-40 minutes. She was having severe weakness and again recurring. So this is the MRI small infarction in the left pons and uh, you see the basic, distal basal artery is high grade stenosis. There was not good PCOM. So I have the 3D pictures, you can see high grade stenosis. There was not good PCOM so circulation was not adequate and she was offered a stenting. This is the stenting was done. It's a balloon expandable coronary stent. We have used it here, and this is the post stenting. And uh, more than two year follow up, she is doing well. So this is intracranial atherosclerosis. Uh, coming to last part, hemorrhagic strokes, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, I work in uh, close collaboration with the neurosurgery team. And in terms of subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, we offer both uh, clipping and coiling to the patient. Both options are discussed. So, aneurysm coiling, all of you know, we can uh, do angiographically, we put a platinum coil inside the aneurysm to block the aneurysm to prevent rebleeding. Various kind of aneurysm uh, can be coiled. <laughs> now, latest thing in the uh, aneurysm is a flow diverter strand. So, suppose aneurysm is a little bit widening, what you, you put a flow diverter strand across neck of the aneurysm in the parent vessel, like this, and over a period of time, this aneurysm will shrink. So this is the flow diverter strand. Metal density is slightly more than the routine strand. This is a case we have done it at our hospital. 71 year old lady presented with right sided third nerve palsy. And this was a PCOM aneurysm which was causing compression on the third nerve. Now you can see the aneurysm neck is relatively wide neck. You can put a coils also but then over a period of 6 months, 1 year it can regrow in size. So this patient was offered a flow diverter treatment. So we place a flow diverter like this. In the parent artery, this is the picture, the aneurysm, <laughs> the flow diverter stent was placed like this. And uh, after one month, the uh, third no palsy recurrence, this is a six month fall off, you can see aneurysm is completely disappeared. This is the pre, this is the post, you don't see any aneurysm here. Anterior cerebral artery is not seen, it is feeling from the opposite side. One more case of uh, flow diverter. Uh, 55 year old gentleman presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage and then uh, we did an angiography and found out that there is a dissecting aneurysm of the proximal basilar artery. So you can't put a coil here because it is, it is pretty wide neck and it is a dissection. Surgery is also written difficult. So we offer a flow diverter treatment option to this gentleman. This is the flow diverter strand placed in the dissection and dissecting aneurysm for healing and uh, he did very well we have six month follow-up also you can see this is an angiography day treatment uh, we have done uh, a couple of days later this is the aneurysm and this is a six month follow-up you can see complete remodeling of the vessel and uh, aneurysm is disappeared so this is the latest in uh, aneurysm treatment with this i end my talk thank you thank you dr Dara. I think we'll come to the last talk in this session, uh, the Neurosurgical Intervention <coughs> in Stroke by Dr. Sivas. We had three excellent talks today, uh, we got a lot of information, I think it's rather fitting that uh, the Neurosurgical Intervention is the last one today, last thing anybody wants to hear is major brain surgery by now. So, uh, I will be talking about uh, decompensive craniotomy for uh, patients with stroke and uh, Keeping brevity in mind, I'll be mostly talking about uh, ischemic stroke, although most of these can be uh, generalized for hemorrhagic stroke as well. Um, what has to be kept in mind is that decompensive craniotomy is essentially a salvage procedure. Uh, most of the damage has already been done by either the ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke and the neurosurgery intervention only comes when patients are deteriorating and uh, the rest of the brain is being affected by the 
severe edema that tends to develop within two to five days of the onset of either uh, ischemic or uh, hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, most of the medical management in terms of hyperosmolar therapy and uh, so on uh, is not uh, working as well as uh, intended. So who are the patients that generally need this uh, decompressive uh, craniectomy? Uh, in general, uh, in terms of ischemic strokes, it's the large posterior fossa infarcts or uh, large hemi uh, hemispheric infarcts uh, that require decompressive craniectomy and uh, very large uh, intracranial hemorrhages uh, in the uh, supratentorial as well as infratentorial uh, regions that require decompression which have not responded to uh, medical management. And there are the very rare uh, venous uh, infarcts also which require uh, decompression. Uh, so coming to the posterior fossa infarcts, um, very large uh, infarcts of the cerebellum uh, tend to cause compression over the uh, brainstem relatively uh, quickly considering the anatomical proximity uh, to the brainstem leading to uh, herniation and uh, drop in consciousness and uh, because they are also very close to the fourth ventricle they can also lead to uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, there have been not that many studies regarding surgical intervention for these patients because uh, it's generally been known how devastating uh, brainstem dysfunction is and how rapidly it can progress. Uh, so surgical intervention for these set of patients has generally been taken for uh, granted whenever they are deteriorating. And uh, in terms of diagnosis, it's generally uh, slightly difficult with CT uh, to diagnose early on large uh, infarcts because of the small volume and uh, the bone artifacts. So MRI tends to be a better tool. So as uh, we can see uh, in the uh, images here, uh, in 1A and 2, we can see the progressively increasing infarct size along with edema uh, that is causing compression and the uh, systems in front of the brainstem have slowly become effaced and corresponding there is a slight uh, hydrocephalus that, has been, uh, that is being seen. And post decompression, we can see that the cistern is once more visible and the third ventricle is slightly uh, decreased in size, uh, suggesting that the uh, ventricular pathways have been uh, re-established and a small subset of patients uh, will also require a, a temporary EVD uh, to ensure uh, hydrocephalus does not cause uh, any further morbidity. Uh, generally, pay, uh, surgical intervention for these patients is a, a very uh, individualized decision based on their comorbidities, the neurological status at the time of um, taking this decision and the, uh, what the caregivers want for these patients. Um, patients who receive surgery uh, who were at a relatively good uh, neurological state tend to have a very dramatic recovery uh, but those with uh, decreased brainstem uh, function or absent brainstem function or even brainstem involvement in the stroke uh, generally do not tend to do uh, very well with this surgery so surgery is generally discouraged for these uh, uh, types of patients. Coming to large uh, hemorrhagic infarcts. Um, Basically, these are infarcts that are involving at least uh, more than 50% of the uh, MCA territory with or without involvement of the anterior cerebral and posterior cerebral artery uh, territories. And why these are important is that although they uh, are only form only 10% of uh, strokes and they tend to uh, occur in younger patients, uh, they have a very high mortality. Why they occur in younger patients is generally because by young I mean less than uh, 60. Um, these patients gen generally do not tend to have as much uh, atherosclerosis, so they don't tend to develop as many collaterals and uh, they also uh, have relatively less reserve because the uh, generalized brain atrophy that happens with age is not as prominent in these patients, so they tend to develop edema and there's less space uh, for the rest of the brain to um, take in this uh, increase in uh, edema. So it's similar for patients with hemorrhagic stroke as well. Um, they tend to have a higher morbidity as the ICH starts to increase and in the first uh, 24 to 48 hours um, systemic hypertension or uncontrolled BP tends to complicate the issue because the bleeding can uh, increase in size along with the cytotoxic and uh, vasogenic edema that sets in uh, at a later stage. Um, the biggest question for ischemic strokes or large ischemic strokes is if you can predict this in the early stage. Uh, radiologically, the uh, most important factors either in CT or MRI is a uh, um, high uh, involvement of the MCA uh, territory greater than 50% of increased volume 
and um, early midline shift coming within the first 24 to 48 hours is also something that uh, points towards this. Uh, clinically, the most uh, important thing that we generally tend to see is that patients uh, drop in the NIHS scale or you have a worsening mm -hmm. neurological status and uh, people also tend to develop uh, pupillary asymmetric which is uh, a sign of uh, herniation. Uh, now, what we have seen over many years is that um, we tend to get the call uh, for many of these patients late in the night uh, when the patient was conscious in the uh, evening but then patients, the, the, the staff or the doctors thought that the patient was asleep but uh, and the, there was not uh, enough uh, adequate checking uh, intervals. So the patient has herniated sometime in the night, it's only been dis uh, discovered later on. Uh, so one of the things that I would like to talk about, uh, which is a slight deviation from the topic is uh, ICP monitoring for this uh, subset of patients. Um, although ICP monitoring is something that has been uh, studied extensively for traumatic brain injury and is used regularly in uh, our hospital, uh, it, it has not been as well studied for uh, stroke. Uh, predominantly because uh, in the initial stages uh, we only had uh, less accurate methods like uh, epidural and subdural monitoring and most of these studies were done during that time and they did not show a lot of correlation but there have been some studies that have been uh, uh, done with pan camel ICP monitors that we use uh, here and uh, they have shown some correlation between uh, rising ICP and um, the need for a decomposive craniotomy. Uh, one of the ways that this can help is that uh, if ICPs are monitored continuously, uh, there is a possibility that we can uh, tailor anterior measures or other um, therapies to decrease the ICP uh, according uh, to the uh, values that are seen continuously rather than continuously having to look at the genesis uh, of the patient, although that is also uh, important. And uh, this can be used to uh, even avoid surgeries uh, in many patients and something that could be uh, done as a study in uh, our hospital potentially. Um, coming back to the topic, when uh, the decision for surgery has may have been made for these patients uh, who are deteriorating, the most important surgery uh, is the hemicraniotomy. Um, as you can see here, uh, the basic uh, incision is a reverse question mark shaped incision and uh, what we intend to do is remove as much of bone as possible uh, so that the brain can herniate through the calvarium rather than onto the uh, opposite side of the brain that is seen in the coronal images here. Uh, one of the most important things that we have to uh, remember while doing this surgery is uh, the temporal decompression. Although the top is decompressed here, it, it helps to salvage the uh, subfans and herniation. But if the uh, craniotomy is not extended to the temporal force of floor, a lot of the uncle herniation is never addressed and results in a suboptimal uh, craniotomy. And uh, this results in uh, outcomes that are not as uh, good as can be expected uh, from a hemicraniotomy. So in B and C, we can see the hemicraniotomy that has been done. And uh, D shows an interoperative image uh, of the brain once the dura and the bone has been uh, opened. Um, a corollary for hemorrhagic stroke is that uh, a lot of studies uh, have been done uh, for uh, an addendum to this surgery. Apart from decompensatory a lot of people have investigated whether removing the ICH uh, really has any uh, effect. And most of these uh, studies have shown that ICH evacuation does not really uh, change much in terms of outcome for the patient. Although everything looks nice on the post-operative scan, there is no blood and everything looks clean. Um, it has not really shown any uh, clinical benefit, so there is still a uh, decompensative craniotomy is still uh, more than adequate to uh, provide good outcomes uh, for these patients. Uh, so this is the post-operative scan and as we can see in 1 and 2 there is a progressively increasing infarct with edema causing midline shift and mass effect and the uh, uh, early and uh, late post-operative scans can show that once the craniotomy has been done, uh, there is a reversal of the uh, midline shift and uh, with, along with this there is a functional uh, improvement as well. Um, the complications of these surgeries generally tend to be uh, bleeding especially for patients with ischemia because they have already been either loaded with antiplatelets or they have received uh, thrombolytic therapy. Uh, so there can be uh, interoperative as well as postoperative uh, bleeding and the usual infection and uh, wound dehiscence and so on. Uh, one of the complications that are uh, particularly specific for uh, decompressive craniectomies is uh, an alteration in CSF uh, flow and uh, this can result in hydrocephalus in a small subset of patients 
as well as uh, sub, uh, subdural effusions. And uh, this can also require uh, uh, resurgery in a uh, small set of patients. And uh, another uh, issue that can develop is the syndrome of the trifan. Although in this patient we can see that the brain is quite uh, full. Uh, in a lot of patients because of uh, difference in the pressures between the atmosphere and the intracranial compartment, this can cause severe compression and progressive neurological decline in the patient that had initially uh, improved. And another similar uh, issue that can develop is paradoxical herniation. Uh, most of these issues are generally resolved uh, by cranioplasty, which is uh, putting the bone flap back uh, somewhere between 8 to uh, 12 weeks. And uh, although this is the disadvantage of crino, uh, crinectomy in that they require another surgery, uh, consider the benefit that there is a significant improvement in mortality, it's always uh, it's something that can be balanced. So, what is the evidence for uh, decompressive craniectomy? As can be seen here, uh, the green part is uh, an MRS of 6, which is uh, death basically. So, in purely medical uh, treatment, and this is from a meta analysis that has been uh, published in 2020, uh, there is a clear benefit in terms of mortality, it's almost half. But this is at the expense of most of these patients having moderate to severe or severe disability. And a lot of these patients, even though they do not die, tend to have severe disability which uh, at the end of the day is a uh, burden for the uh, patients, uh, bystanders, because they require significant help for their uh, activities of uh, daily living. Uh, but in terms of mortality alone, there is uh, absolutely no doubt that decompensative cranectomy helps uh, these patients. Um, the small areas of confusion for decompressive cranectomy, uh, one is timing. Uh, this is a sandwich procedure, so the earlier is uh, the earlier the better. And uh, what has been seen is after 48 hours, there really is not much uh, benefit for uh, patients receiving this surgery. And there have also been some proponents for prophylactic surgery. Before the patient uh, deteriorates, uh, some surgeons tend to advocate surgery in a little more uh, aggressive manner. Uh, the second is older age. A uh, lot of these patients uh, have good outcomes below 60, but above 60, although there is some mortality benefit, patients still uh, don't have as good uh, outcomes. Uh, they have higher uh, disability. So for this subset of older patients, they require some amount of uh, individualized treatment based on the caregiver's uh, wishes, wishes as well. Um, the latter is also a point of discussion because dominant versus non-dominant strokes have different outcomes. Uh, predominantly because dominant strokes tend to cause aphasia. Uh, so quality of life tends to be very poor for these patients both in terms of communication for themselves and uh, also for uh, their caregivers because it's difficult to look after these uh, patients. Um, although studies have not shown any real uh, difference, measurable difference in outcomes, um, most surgeons generally tend to uh, discourage patients with uh, dominant strokes. Um, because there is a perceived uh, decrease in quality of life. At the end of the day, quality of life is the most, uh, possibly the most important determinant for these uh, surgeries because that is what the patient is, patient and the caregivers is uh, experiencing once the surgery is done and the patient has gone home. Um, this is something that's very difficult to identify and measure because it's very subjective and uh, mostly it is uh, through uh, surveys. So one survey that was done has shown that there is a 45% decrease in quality of life uh, post-surgery and 50% of these patients tend to have depression. But they also found at the same time that more than 75% of these uh, patients or caregivers um, would have given consent again if this uh, happened, uh, looking at this retrospectively. So uh, to summarize, I would like to say that decompressive cranectomy uh, has a very large amount of evidence to prove that it is uh, very important uh, to uh, decrease mortality in these patients. Um, but uh, with the understanding for both the clinician and the patient's uh, family that there is going to be some disability in these patients once the surgery is done. Um, so the decision for these surgeries have to be individualized for each patient. Thank you, Dr. C. Wilson. Uh, that's the last part of the topic. Uh, the <clears throat> Before winding up, I think uh, we'll open the floor for discussion. If there are any questions, we'll take it. One question, Murali. You mentioned about the importance of the phenomenon and the MRI phenomenon. How do you clinically differentiate? 
stroke, when we are talking about the stroke. Okay, it's, it's not, uh, it's not very easy to diagnose a hemorrhage from a ischemia or an embolic phenomenon. Now, usually the embolus or the embolic phenomena tend to be very large. From my experience, the uh, hemorrhagic strokes usually have a very high PP. The hypertension is probably the tumor of say 180, 200, 200 by 120. In these cases, I usually suspect an hemorrhage. Uh, well, an embolic phenomenon, the BP may not be high, but it's because of the embolus that is going and striking the, the uh, uh, what you call artery and blocking it. It's not the BP as such. So, hemorrhagic infarcts or hemorrhage is usually an end effect of hypertension rather than uh, uh, what you call rather than an embolic phenomenon, which is not because of hypertension. There are certain scores, but they are usually not very. Uh, helpful in diagnosing and after the evident, after the surging of CTs, uh, we usually do not find out, uh, we do not uh, try to diagnose a hemorrhage from an embolus or an ischemia, clinically. If I say the accuracy of uh, It may be good tool, but uh, can you tell me how it's going to help in treating the patient? You can suppose some patient with a stroke comes to the ER and okay, you do transcranial Doppler and you find out some vessel is occluded, but how it's going to help? Whether there is a hemorrhage is there or not, you have to do CT scan, how big the infarction is there, all those other parameters we cannot assess on transcranial Doppler. And I don't think so, accuracy is 90%. I don't think so. We require uh, expertise and then also the amount of information we get from transcranial doctor is very limited. For sure. So I don't think so it's going to help. Maybe it, it, it's useful in a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient who develop vasospasm to monitor the spasm. Bedside you can do it uh, on those patients, it's helpful. I think when you are suspecting clinically a stroke in the emergency department, the million dollar question is, is it a bleed or not, or is it an ischemic stroke? So transcranial Doppler may not help in that aspect. CT is obviously the best method to rule out a bleed and then you can go ahead with either IV thrombolysis or you know, mechanical thrombectomy, which is absolutely contraindicated if it is a bleed. So the, the, the thing to know is whether there is a bleed or not. I think that the transplant Doppler may not be very useful. I have two doubts. The first one is regarding uh, the role of thrombolysis after 4.4 hours. There's few studies. One is extends RCT between 4.5 and 9 hours. If still the MRI deficient study show viable area, can we do thrombolysis? That is one question. Second, if there is a large vessel huge clot burden. Why are we doing thrombolysis and taking for mechanical thrombectomy rather than we can straight away take for early thrombectomy that will be better in terms of cost and bleeding. These are my two questions. Regarding the first question, uh, see now the FDA approved the AHA guidelines. No, They 
speak about stroke thrombolysis within 4.5 hours. But there are two other situations where you need additional modalities to be taken up. For example, a wake-up stroke. When the patient wakes up, you really do not know when the uh, onset was. Or when the patient is having a deficit where the patient cannot explain. For example, anosognosia or aphasia. Patient is not unable to say at what time the stroke started. Also, unwitnessed, the patient is found unconscious. You cannot say what is the time of onset. So, in such situations, you can resort to special imaging modalities. For example, a CT perfusion or an MR perfusion study where you look for a flare diffusion mismatch. So, when there is a numbra and a penumbra and you still see the deficit is there, you do not know exactly at what time it began, but you see that there is a penumbra which is a salvageable tissue, still salvageable by reperfusion, you can resort to a thrombolysis. So that is regarding the first question. Regarding the second one, when there is a large clot burden, still IV thrombolysis will offer a benefit to the patient. Okay. So time is very important as we already uh, we have seen time is of the essence. So earlier the treatment better the result. So for an IV thrombolysis it hardly takes few minutes. Then already we have talked about the logistics of shifting the patient, taking the patient to the cat suit, getting things ready. Many results have, may have to come. So these times, so every minute, millions of neurons are getting affected. So you give a thrombolysis, you give the benefit of, of uh, reperfusion to a selected subset of patients. Okay? And whatever benefit you can get out of it, you have already got. So some patients, the clot will not open up. So such patients, we do not know which person, which patient, we do not know. But the patient is now taken to a capsule, they look for the vessel whether it has opened up or not. If it is already open, then we do not do anything. But if it has not, then maybe he has to intervene. Thank you. So there are studies regarding your second question. There are studies going on like major vessel occlusion. We do IV thrombolysis yeah. mechanical thrombectomy versus direct thrombectomy. So some studies they have shown that there is no benefit of addition of IV thrombolysis mechanical thrombectomy. But some studies suggest that it, it may be helpful in some distal clot which might have gone into the cortical vessels so which may not be taken care of by the mechanical thrombectomy so guideline says you have to give IV thrombolysis few patients we have seen artery is open up and we can do thrombectomy okay thank you if there are no more questions i think we'll wind up this session over to doctor okay so we will close the session uh, we thank everyone for coming and we thank morley sir so this sir dr dayara dr bindu and dr stevenson Thank you. We'll wind up for breakfast at Gourmet. Thank you. Thank you.